This morning we are beginning a, a series in the book of Amos. And though written at a different time and in a different place, the book of Amos is very relevant at the present time and in this place. Now why, why do I say that? Well, there are a number of reasons for saying that, but let me mention just one in particular. In chapter 4 of the book of Amos, that we'll come on to in a few weeks' time, the Lord spoke to the people of Israel. And he listed to the people of Israel a number of different events that had happened to them in the, in the previous years. He listed a series of trials that he had sent upon the people of Israel. And as the Lord listed those events, listed those trials that he had sent upon the people of Israel, he said to them again and again and again, yet you have not returned to me. Yet you have not returned to me. So, just to, to point them out to you, chapter 4 and verse 6, the Lord says, I gave you empty stomachs in every city and lack of bread in every town, yet you have not returned to me, declares the Lord. Chapter 4, verse 8, people staggered from town to town for water, but did not get enough to drink, yet you have not returned to me, declares the Lord. Verse 9, many times I struck your gardens and vineyards. I struck them with blight and mildew. Locusts locust devoured your fig and olive trees. Yet you have not returned to me, declares the Lord. Verse 10, I sent plagues among you as I did to Egypt. I killed your young men with the sword along with your captured horses. I, I filled your nostrils with the stench of your camps. Yet you have not returned to me, declares the Lord. Verse 11 of chapter 4, I overthrew some of you as I overthrew Sodom and Gomorrah. You were like a burning stick snatched from the fire, yet you have not returned to me, declares the Lord. Many testing things that happened in the, in the lives of the, the people of Israel. Things that you would think would have caused them to, to humble themselves and, and turn to the Lord and seek Him. You would have expected them to have cried out to the Lord for mercy. And yet He says, I've sent all of these things upon you and you have not returned to me. And can we not think of our own nation in a similar way at the present time? Is it not true that over the past few years, many major and testing things have happened in the life of our nation? We've gone through Brexit. We've gone through the COVID pandemic, the, the cost of living crisis. The death of the Queen, succession of different Prime Ministers. And couldn't the Lord say to our nation, as he said to Israel then, yet you have not turned to me. We've prayed, haven't we, through these things that the people would turn to the Lord. And yet, has it happened? But then we don't just look at the nation. We look at the people of God in the nation. We look at the churches within the nation. We, we look at ourselves. And could God say to the churches of our nation, I, I've brought all these things upon you and yet you've not returned to me. These events of, of recent years that we've, that we've all gone through. 
Have they caused us to, to humble ourselves before the Lord? Have, have they caused us to seek the Lord more earnestly than we, than we did before? And in the book of Amos, the Lord calls upon people to hear. To hear him, to, to turn to him, to, to seek him. And this morning, we're going to look at the, the passage we read. Chapter 1, verse 1, down to, to chapter 2 and, and verse 3. And the, the, the first thing for us to see from, from this opening section of the book of Amos is that the Lord roars. The Lord roars. The, the theme of the book of Amos it is given at the beginning there in verse 2. The Lord roars from Zion. Then in, in chapter 3, in verse 8, it says, The lion has roared, who will not fear? The sovereign Lord has spoken, who can but prophesy that the lion has roared, the Lord has spoken. Have you ever heard a lion roar? Some of you may have done, you, you may have visited a zoo and and heard a, a lion roar. I don't know, some of you may have been on safari and, and heard a, a lion roar. It's said that a lion's roar is so powerful that if the conditions are right, it can be heard up to five miles away. And the book of Amos is the roaring of a lion. In Revelation chapter 5, the Apostle John has a vision of the Lord Jesus Christ exalted in heaven. And in Revelation chapter 5 and verse 5, the Lord Jesus Christ is described as the lion of the tribe of Judah. The Lord Jesus Christ, that great lion, he roars from heaven. And, and speaks upon earth. And, and that's what the book of Amos is. The book of Amos is the roaring of the lion. The book of Amos is Jesus Christ, the, the lion of the, the tribe of Judah, roaring. So the people will hear. So the people will listen. According to the World Wildlife Fund website, male lions roar to show their power and to defend their territory and to scare off intruders. And in the book of Amos, the Lord roars, the lion roars to show that he is God, to, to defend his honor and to convict his enemies. So that's the book of Amos. The lion has roared, the the sovereign Lord has spoken. Secondly, then, we, we, we see that the Lord roared through his prophet. The, the Lord roars through his prophet, the, the prophet Amos. Chapter 1, verse 1, the words of Amos. This man Amos was called by the Lord to, to bring his word to the people of Israel. Now, we, we don't know much about this man Amos. He, he's not mentioned anywhere else in the Bible. Everything we know about Amos is discovered within the, the book of, of Amos. And we're told here that Amos was a, a shepherd. The words of Amos, one of the shepherds of Tekoa. But that, that word translated shepherd in, in verse 1 to, to speak of Amos, it's, it's not the usual Old Testament word for, for a shepherd. It's not the word that, that speaks of someone who, who simply looks after the sheep. But, but this word, shepherd, that the chooser of Amos in, in, in verse 1 means something more along the lines of a, a sheep breeder. It seems that Amos was a, a, a businessman who, who, who bred sheep and, and, and sold sheep. The, the, the word for shepherd here it is used in just one other place in the Old Testament. It's two kings. 
Um, chapter 3 and verse 4, speaking about a man named Misha, king of Moab, and it says, Misha, king of Moab, raised sheep. He had to supply the king of Israel with a hundred thousand lambs and with the wool of a hundred thousand rams. And that's the, the same word that, that's used of Amos here. So it seems that he was a sheep breeder. He was a, a, a businessman. He was from a place called Tekoa, which was in the southern kingdom of Judah, not too far from Jerusalem and Bethlehem. But Amos was called by God to preach largely in the northern kingdom of Israel. And we're told here in verse 1 that he preached two years before the earthquake. Read of a great earthquake that took place in in the region. And the, the prophet Zechariah also spoke of that earthquake. Zechariah chapter 4 and verse 5. You will flee by my mountain valley, for it will extend to Azel. You will flee as you fled from the earthquake in the days of Uzziah, king of Judah. And then we're also told that Amos reigns during, Amos preached during the reigns of Uzziah, king of Judah. And Jeroboam the second king of Israel. And King Uzziah reigned in, in Judah for about 52 years. King Jeroboam the second reigned in Israel for, for 41 years. That was around the same time as that the prophet Isaiah lived and, and preached. These long reigns of these kings, it was a time of relative peace and stability and prosperity in Israel and Judah. But sadly, as we'll see as we go through the book, that stability, that prosperity in Israel and Judah at this time led to spiritual arrogance. The people simply assumed that all was well. Because things were generally comfortable. And because they had the scriptures and the prophets. The, the people of Israel and Judah just assumed that they could go through the motions of, of worshipping God and say, it is well with my soul. And the Lord roared through the prophet Amos to show that this was not the case. One of the things that the book of Amos does is to warn us of coasting, of taking things easy with regards to our relationship with God. The book of Amos warns against the attitude that thinks, I've gone to church for years. And, and things are fairly comfortable in my life, so, so all must be well between me and God. The book of Amos says that that's not necessarily so. Chapter 6 of the book of Amos begins with these words, Woe to you who are complacent in Zion. Some translations have woe to those who are at ease in Zion. The book of Amos says to us, don't just assume that because things are comfortable and because you're going to church week by week that, that all is well with you and God. Cause us to seek the Lord, to, to earnestly seek the Lord. So the Lord roars. The Lord roars through his prophet, through the, the prophet Amos. Thirdly, the, the Lord roars to the nations. The Lord roars to the nations. And from verse 3 of chapter 1 all the way down to verse 3 of, of chapter 2. The Lord roared through Amos and spoke about six different nations that were near to Israel and Judah. And some of them were not only near in terms of their, their geography, but some of them were, were closely related to, to the people of Israel. So some of the nations referred to here were, were, were descended from Abraham and, and had a link then, a, a, a physical link to the, to the people of Israel. 
And the Lord spoke of these six different nations. And he spoke of their sins. He spoke of Damascus. That's Syria. Verse, verse 3. And then he spoke of Gaza, where the, the Philistines ca came from in, in verse 6. And then he spoke of Tyre, Phoenicia, in verse 9. And then he spoke of Edom, in verse 11. And he spoke of Ammon, in verse 13. And then the Lord spoke of Moab in, in chapter 2 and and verse 1, and the Lord spoke in detail about these nations, and he, he spoke in detail about the sins of these nations. When, when we read the Old Testament, we, we, we can sometimes imagine that, that during the Old Testament period, God was only concerned with Israel, and that, that God was only at, at work in, in Israel. But Amos chapter 1 shows us that that was, was not the case. That God was concerned with all the nations. God was at work in all the nations. God was concerned about the sins of all the nations. And the people of these nations that are mentioned in, in chapter 1. They, they did not have the prophets who, who preached God's word. They, they did not have the scriptures as the Israelites had. But these people were made in God's image. These people had a God-given conscience to inform them of right and wrong. They, these people were accountable to God for, for the sins that they committed. We read about that in, in Romans chapter 2. Romans chapter 2, verses 14 and 15. When, when Gentiles who do not have the law do by nature things required by the law, they are a law for themselves, even though they do not have the law, since they show that the requirements of the law are written on their hearts. Their consciences also bearing witness. And their thoughts now accusing, now even defending them. And the people of these nations around Israel, they didn't have prophets like Amos preaching to them, but they had a conscience that was preaching to them. But still, they sinned against the Lord. And God cared about that. God cared about their sins. People sometimes sin, don't they, with the attitude, who cares? Who cares? Wh whose business is it but mine? Well, God, God cares. God cares. And as the Lord speaks of the, the sins of the nations in, in this chapter... He uses a certain phrase over and over again. You, you'll have noticed it when we, when we read through it. For Verse 3, for three sins of Damascus, even for four. Verse 6, for three sins of Gaza, even for four. Verse 9, for three sins of Tyre, even for four. And, and so on and so on. The, the idea being that, that these nations had added sin upon sin. That these nations were, were full of, of sin. And each time he said that, the Lord said that he would not hold back from, from judging them. He would not hold back from, from punishing them. For three sins of Damascus, even for four, I will not turn back. For three sins of Gaza, even for four, I will not turn back. For three sins of Tyre, even for four, I will not turn back, and so on. And the, the translators, have to, to, to give the sense of it, added the, the, the phrase there, my wrath. For three sins, even for four, I will not turn back my wrath. And as the Lord speaks of these different nations, 
and the judgment he will bring upon them. He, he says of a number of them that he, he will judge them with, with fire. So, for example, in verse 13, at the end of chapter 1, we, we read of the, the sins of the, of the nation of Ammon. For three sins of Ammon, even for four, I will not turn back my wrath. Because he ripped open the pregnant women of Gilead in order to extend his borders. The nation of Ammon attacked the weak and the defenseless pregnant women and the, the children they carried in, in order to extend their borders. And the Lord said of Ammon then in verse 14, I will set fire to the walls of Rabbah that will consume her fortresses. Amid war cries on the day of battle, amid violent winds on a, a stormy day. The Lord cares about the sins of the nations. The Lord is concerned about the sins of the nations. The Lord was concerned when Ammon attacked pregnant women and, and the, the little ones that they carried. The Lord cares. The Lord is concerned when nations do not allow little ones to be safe in their mother's wombs. The Lord cares. The Lord roars. The Lord says that he will judge the nations. The Lord roars. The Lord roars through his prophet. The Lord roars to the nations. And then fourthly, the Lord roars in his grace. The Lord roars in his grace. You, you could think, I, I suppose, having, having read this passage and as having begun to thought about, think about this passage, you, you, you could think to yourself, well, I, I don't see much grace in this passage. Well, think again. Think again. Why does the Lord roar at all? <laughs> why, why, why? Why does the Lord roar at all? What, why did the Lord speak through Amos about the sins of the nations and, and as we'll see in the passage that follows about the sins of, of Israel and Judah? Why does the Lord continue today? through his word, to speak to people of their sin and, and his judgment that will fall upon it. The Lord could keep silent about such things, couldn't he? The Lord could keep silent about his judgment and then let it suddenly fall without warning, but instead of doing that, he roars and tells people to take note. So that they will turn to him. And as the Lord roared through Amos with this message of judgment to Israel, he at the same time called upon them to, to seek him, to seek him and live, to, to seek him and be saved. Chapter 5 and verse 4. This is what the Lord says to the house of Israel. Seek me and live. Seek me and live. And as the Lord speaks in his word today, as the Lord speaks in his word today of sin and, and of the judgment to come, he's, he's saying to people, seek me, seek me and live. He's saying to us this morning, seek me and live. In the book of Amos, the lion roars. We, we, we saw it a few minutes ago from Revelation chapter 5 that the, the Lord Jesus Christ is the, the lion of the tribe of Judah. Lord, the Lord Jesus Christ is the, the lion who roars in the book of Amos. But you know the amazing thing about that passage in Revelation chapter 5 <laughs> is that at the same time as being described as a lion. 
Jesus Christ is also described as a lamb. In fact, we're told in Revelation chapter 5, in verses 5 and 6, that when John was called to look at the lion of the tribe of Judah, he, he turned and he, he looked at the lion of the tribe of Judah and he says, and I saw a lamb looking as if it had been slain. Jesus Christ, the lion, the great king who roars and tells us of our sin and the judgment to come. Jesus Christ, the lion, is at the same time the lamb. The lamb who died on the cross and took the, the penalty and the, the, the punishment of sin so that all who repent of their sin and believe in him are, are forgiven and, and saved from the wrath to come. <clears throat> Isaiah, who, as we've seen, preached around the, the same sort of time as Amos. He spoke about, about Jesus' death in this way, didn't he? Isaiah 53, verse 5, he, he was pierced for our transgressions, he was crushed for our iniquities. The punishment that brought us peace was upon him, by his wounds we are healed. He was oppressed and afflicted, yet he did not open his mouth. He was led like a lamb to the slaughter. And as a sheep before her shearers is silent, so he did not open his mouth. The, the lion who roars to us in the book of Amos went to the cross of Calvary like a lamb. in order to, to pay the price for sin and, and to save sinners. And in that passage in, in Revelation chapter 5, where, where Jesus is described as the lion and as the lamb, he's, he's worshipped in heaven. And, and listen to how he's worshipped in heaven. And keep in mind Amos chapter 1 as you, you listen to this. Revelation chapter 5 and, and verse 9, the, the, the song is sung to, to the lion, to the lamb. The song is sung to Jesus Christ. You are worthy to take the scroll and to open its seals because you were slain. And with your blood, you purchased men for God from every tribe and language and people, and nation. Jesus Christ saves people of all nations. He, Jesus Christ, by his blood, saves people from Damascus, and from Gaza, and from Tyre, and from Edom, and from Ammon, and from Moab, from the nations mentioned here in, in Amos chapter 1. And Jesus Christ, by his blood, saves people from, from this nation and from, from all the different nations represented here this morning. He saves people from all the nations of the world. The lion roars throughout the world. The people of the nations will turn to him and be saved. Now, if you visit a zoo and hear a lion roar, I, I, I guess that's, that's, that's quite exciting, isn't it? You know, imagine everybody stopping in the zoo. <gasps> Did you hear that? The lion roared. If you were camping on the plains of Africa and you heard a lion's roar, then it wouldn't be quite so exciting, would it? Even if it were five miles away, you would want to get up and run. You would want to run as far away as you could from the, from the roaring of the lion. And in the book of Amos, the lion roars so that you will hear and so that you will run. But the difference is this. 
out in the wild, you would run away from the lion that roars. But the book of Amos tells you to run to the lion that roars. It tells you to run to Jesus Christ and believe in him. The lion who is the lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world.